Hi folks, hope everybody's okay. It's good to be with you. Happy Sunday. Uh, it's lovely to be with you. Don't forget to check out my website, jasonburnspreacher.com. Uh, jasonburnspreacher.com. jasonburnspreacher.com. You can go on my website and then you can go on Twitter and you can go on Facebook if you want to join me on Facebook. So it's good to be with you. We're looking at the doctrine of justification by faith. And so let's come before the Lord. It's good to be with you. And uh, God is good, and let's pray. Father, we come before you today. We give you the praise, we give you the glory, and we give you the honor. We thank you for all your goodness and all your love and all your blessings to us. We give you the praise, we give you the glory, and we give you the honor. And Father, we pray as we look at your word today, teach us, speak to each person today who hears these words. Open their eyes to truth that they may know you and trust you and have faith in you, Lord. So, Father, speak to people today. Bless them through these words. Bless them through the preaching of your word. May people be drawn into your word and drawn into yourself. Father, we ask these things in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. So we're looking at uh, justification by faith. And uh, our key passage is Romans chapter 3. So if you'd like to get your Bible out, <clears throat> so this is going to be an in-depth uh, message. It's a sermon. Uh, I preached it today at the fellowship that, I, that I'm privileged to be involved in and uh, have a cup of tea, so forgive me. So we're going to get in-depth on the doctrine <coughs> of justification by faith. <coughs> so we're reading from Romans chapter 3. What advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is the of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe, shall the unbelief make the faith of God without effect? <coughs> God forbid. Ye let God be true, but every man a liar. And it is written that thou might be justified in the sayings, and might overcome when thou art judged. But if our righteousness command the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God have more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather as we be slanderous reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then, are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, <coughs> that they are all under sin. And it's written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre, and their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things whether the law saith, it said to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all of sin that come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by this grace, through his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom, hath, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justified of him which believe in Jesus. Where is boasting that? It is excluded by what law of works, nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God 
which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we, we establish the law. So we're looking at the doctrine of justification by faith in Romans chapter 3. And I remember about 10, maybe 15 years ago, maybe even longer than that, I was in Ireland working with some missionaries, uh, and we went uh, in a village near Mullingar. We knocked on a door, and a guy came to the door. He was a Roman Catholic, and he told us that there were these many, many saints that would protect him and intercede for him so that he could get to heaven. And even the Muslims believe that Muhammad will intercede for them in order that they might get to heaven. And many people believe that the way to get to heaven is if the saints can't help you, you can do it yourself by repentance, by doing good works. And so men believe and women believe, many believe that they can get to heaven either by the saints or by what they do, etc., that is justification by works. That is man trying to get into heaven by man's ability, by man's appointment, by man's strategy, by man's wisdom. And that is not the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is the doctrine of justification by faith. So let us move on. Martin Luther said, every week I preach justification by faith to my people because every week they forget it. John Calvin said, justification by faith is the hinge on which all true religion turns. And Jonathan Edwards, the great revival preacher in America, said, the Apostle Paul is abundant in teaching that we are justified by faith alone, without the works of the law. There is no one doctrine that, that he insists so much upon, and that he handles with so much distinctiveness, explaining, giving reasons, and answering objections. The definition of the doctrine of justification by faith by John MacArthur. In its theological sense, <clears throat> justification is forensic or purely legal term. It describes what God declares about the believer, not what he does to change the believer. In fact, justification affects no actual change whatsoever in the sinner's nature, or character justification is a divine judicial act it changes our status only but it carries ramifications that guarantee other changes will follow so what he means there justification is a legal declaration before God that we are justified declared right and guilt-free on account of the life death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that all that Christ did for us, he took the punishment, the wrath that we deserve, and his, his righteousness and who he is, is put to our account. So God sees Jesus and all that he achieved for us in him. It's kind of like this. Imagine uh, somebody's getting married. And at that moment... It legally is declared by the priest or the minister or the civil servant of the state. These people are now married. At that moment, that declaration, they become legally married. There is a new status. One minute you are not married, now you are married. And God gives you a legal status in Christ that you are declared right, guiltless, free, set free, and, and, and no condemnation because of who Christ is and what he's done for you. Who is God in the flesh? John MacArthur writes, in biblical terms, justification is a divine verdict of not guilty, fully righteous. John MacArthur says it also more than this. Christ's own infinite merit becomes our ground on which the believer stands before God. You could read Romans 5.19. So, for as by one man disobedience, many were made sinners, so by obedience of one shall be made righteous. All that Christ is, is put to our account. And that means it gives us certain blessings as we are declared right before God 
on account of Jesus Christ. We turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 15, it says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You see, once we're justified before God, we become adopted. We become heirs of Christ, Romans 8, 17. And the children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together, we become inheritors of all of God's blessings in Christ. We become united to Christ, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 4, 17. We have Christ in us, Colossians 1, 27. All these blessings from justification, the declaration that God forgives us in Christ. Now, I have three points. Justification by faith was misunderstood by the Jews, number one. Justification cannot be achieved by works. Number three, justification is by Christ received by faith. Number one, justification by faith was misunderstood by the Jews. Number two, justification can be cannot be achieved by works and justification by Christ Justification is by Christ received by faith. So number one, justification by faith was misunderstood by the Jews. Romans chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. What advantage have the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. The people of God, the Jewish people, had the Holy Scriptures. And they failed to see in the Holy Scriptures what God was doing. That he was bringing in this, that he was bringing in a salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. Now if you turn to 2 Kings chapter 22 verse 3 and 10, you can see how they discovered, rediscovered the word of God there. In Nehemiah, if we go to Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1 to 6. So please get your Bible out and check everything that I say because you need to make sure that what I teach is in the Bible. So please get your Bible out and check everything that I say. And anybody else, for that matter, what they say. So if you look at Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 to 6. And the people gathered themselves together as one man in the street that before the water gate, and they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded to, to, to Israel and Ezra and the priest brought the law before the congregation both men and women and all that would hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the woman and that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood Matthian, Shema, Anai, Uri, Hilkiah, Hil, sorry, Hilkiah, and uh, Messiah uh, on his right hand and on his left hand, Padiah, Mishael, Malachi, and Hashem, etc., etc. Verse 5, and Ezra opened the book, in his sight of all the people for he was above all the people and when he opened it and all the people stood up and ezra blessed the lord the great god and all the people answered and men with li amen lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshipped the lord with their faces to the ground and then verse 8 so they read in the book of in the law of god distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading so the Jews were blessed with the word of God. Ezra is expounding the word of God. They had the word of God, but it didn't bring the vast majority of Jewish people to salvation. They had the blessing of the word, but they didn't understand the word. If you turn to Luke 24, 44, Luke, if you turn to Luke 24, 
Luke 24, 44. Luke 24, Luke 24, 44. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So the Lord is saying there, look, if you look at the Old Testament, you can find me. You can find Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. But they didn't see it because they they missed what God was saying in the Old Testament. The word of God was preserved by the Jews. Uh, if you read Josephus, Josephus mentions 22 books of the Old Testament. Even though the Protestant Bible has more books in of the old testament they are the exact books of what josephus mentions only what they did in the uh in the jewish uh, old testament when the jews were, were in the time of josephus and before josephus what they did is they clumped a number of books together so that's why we have 22 in the jewish um bible but in our Protestant Bible, we have more books in the Old Testament. It's not that there are, they are actually more books uh, than in the Jewish book. It's just that the Jews, uh, it's like it's like this. Look, I'll just show you. Look. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the Jews had uh, a collection of books. And, the, and they made, I would say, four or five, they made one book. Right? So that's the Jewish, same amount, four books there. So that's the Jewish there, yeah. Process of Bible here, four books. Jewish book, one book, right? So what, <coughs> what I'm trying to explain there is that the Jews had 22 books in, uh, in the Old Testament. We have more books, but they're the exact same amount of writing <coughs> are books. As it was in the Jewish Old Testament that the Jews had. Okay, exactly the same. And that, what that shows you is that they were preserved, that they were preserved by, by God. But the point is this. So I, I Google Josephus on scripture and read that and see what you think. But the point is, is that they were preserved. And the main point is that they didn't understand what the Old Testament was about. They didn't understand it. They missed the mark. And you know, you can have a Bible, but miss the mark. You can have a Bible before you and not know divine truth. You can have a Bible and not know the Messiah. You can have a Bible and not be right with God. You can have a Bible and we can and be walking in a holy life. We can have a Bible, but not be using it. It's kind of like a husband and a wife. They're, out, they're going on a holiday to Spain and... They're at Madrid and they've got to go to a village outside Madrid and the wife has got a map to get to the village and the husband is stubborn and he says, I know how to get there. So the husband says, come on, we'll go. We don't want to read the map. And he goes and he, he can't find the village. But he had the map, but he didn't use the map. That's like the Jews. They stubbornly said, no, we can find our way to God, but they didn't use the map of the word of God so they got in trouble and we should learn a lesson from that that if we have the bible to ask the holy spirit to teach us it is a it is a spiritual book but we must study it as well we must study the scriptures we must uh, ask the holy spirit to teach us the scriptures but we must study the scriptures and it always has to focus on jesus christ if our theology of our studies are not focusing on who jesus is and what jesus has done then we become like the Jews of old and we miss what it was all about in the first place. So the Jews failed to understand justification. Generally speaking, there was a remnant. For example, Abraham had faith and, you know, the patriarchs had faith, but the, the natural Jew failed to understand 
Secondly, justification can't be achieved by good works. Imagine you go into a scrapyard or a junkyard and you see many, many, many cars piled up high. There's not one car in the scrapyard <coughs> that is drivable. Every one of the cars in the scrapyard is absolutely ready to be melted down. You can't drive any away. Everyone is a mess. God is saying every human being is a mess spiritually, that they do not really seek God. If you don't believe me, look at, uh, look at uh, verse, uh, verse, uh, verse 10, as it is written, uh, Romans 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. And their tongue they have used to see. The poison of ashes is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that... Whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. But the point is this. It says, all, verse 23, for all, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every human being is a fallen creature and will not, and here's the point, and would not seek God unless God opened their eyes. Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 7 to 8. Because Romans 8, verse 7 to 8. Because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Men and women and boys and girls are born in the flesh, and by the flesh they cannot please God. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of the heart. You can't say to God, oh, I'm an intellectual. I'm a great intellect and I will discern whether God exists or not. And if I think he exists, I will then seek him. No, you cannot even know God by your own intellect without God helping you. You can say, well, I go on Hajj, or I do good deeds in my church or in my, in, in my organization where they're the job as witness and moments, and I do good deeds. Your good deeds are filthy rags. They are not spiritually vibrant or alive to God. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 to 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 to 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Verse 12 to 18. Listen to this about the Jews. Seeing then that we have this hope, we, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a, a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds, here it is, their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken uh, un away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So even the Jews with the Old Testament were blinded. They couldn't see the truth. And until their eyes were open, they would not see the truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, please turn to it. Please get your Bible out. Please, come on. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the carnal mind, but the, 
natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet himself is just of no man. The carnal mind cannot know the things of God. Men are hopeless. They are blind. They have no hope. There is no way of knowing God by our natural inclination or ability. We are blind. We are lost. There is no way you can boast before God with your repentance. There is no way you can boast before God by saying Muhammad intercedes for me. There is no way you can boast before God and say the saints will intercede for you. No. You are undone. You have absolutely nothing to boast in. You are spiritually dead. You are lost in your flesh. Ezekiel eleven nineteen. Ezekiel eleven nineteen. Ezekiel eleven nineteen. And I, notice, and I will give them one heart. Who will? Man or God? And I will give them one heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh. And will give them the heart of flesh. Who? God. God. Ephesians 2, 1 to 5. Man is lost unless God. Ephesians 2 1 to 5 and you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses who God Where in your times past you walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the earth The spirit of na that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our confrontations in time past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others but god but god but god but god who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us now here it is even when we were dead in sins who have quickened us together with christ by grace you are saved but god if it was not that word but god Every human being would be lost to hell. But God stepped in and caused salvation. But God stepped in and saved you and me. But God did it. He opened your eyes. If you see the truth today, he opened your eyes. Any spiritual life that is in you, it is of God. And you who reject God, you who say, I'm a Muslim and I don't want to know your Christianity, or I'm an atheist, I don't want to know. You cannot know God until God opens your eyes. And until you realize that your good deeds are filthy rags, they are dirty, they are rotten, they are rags. They cannot please God because you are a natural. You are walking in the natural and you hate the living God. If you were to be me in Christ, you would put him on the cross and you would crucify him because you hate the spiritual things of God. The natural man cannot discern the things of God. And until God gives you a new heart, until God changes you, you're never going to stop being a rebellious sinner against God. Even if you look righteous before your friends at the mosque or friends at the Mormon temple or or your friends at the Jehovah's Witness Hall, or your friends at uh, an atheist rally, you may look righteous and nice and good on the outward, but inside, you do not love the true and living God. You do not love Jesus Christ. You're still a rebel in the flesh against God. It's kind of like this. Imagine someone is in a castle. They're in a castle and they're chained to the wall man is chained to sin he cannot break free from his sin he is chained he is chained to sin and he cannot break free 
No matter how hard he tries, no matter what he does, no matter how hard he pulls, no matter how much he screams, no matter how much he grabs that chain and pulls, he cannot break free. And no matter how much man tries by religion, by reason, by any other way, and tries to break free, he cannot because he is bound in sin. The only way to be set free is to be free in Christ. The only way to be set free is for the Spirit of God to touch that heart. And to open the eyes of that unbeliever. You must have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. You may be the top imam of Arabia. You may be the biggest Muslim scholar in all of Islam. But you're lost. You may be the most righteous Mormon in all of America. You're lost. You may be the most kindest, tenderest, loving atheist in all of the West. You're lost. You're in the flesh. You're undone. You're going to hell. And to a wrath to come. Because you don't know the grace of God. You are lost forever. Because you trusted in man. You trusted in your own righteousness. You trusted in your own wisdom. You trusted in your own ability. You trusted in your own religion. You trusted in your own culture. But you didn't trust in Christ. That's where we come next. Justification is by Christ received by faith. Romans chapter 3 verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. We'll stop there. In the next few weeks, we'll go more in depth on the doctrine of justification by faith. This is just a general survey of Romans 3, but we'll go into more detail. Verse 21. Verse 21. It says, But now the righteousness of God without the Lord is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Excuse me. What is the righteousness of God? It is the life of Jesus Christ. It is not by what we do that saves us. It is all that Christ is and has done for us that saves us. It's kind of like this. Imagine I'm in prison for a murder. And imagine um, I get a pardon from the Queen and I get a document. And it's got a ribbon around it and it's rolled up. And the prison officer comes and... The governor is with them and they give me this piece of paper that is my pardon from the queen. I take the pardon and I'm set free. What saved me? It was the pardon. It was the document that declared me right and guiltless that saved me. All my hand did was just to receive the pardon. And that is justification by faith. Justification is... A legal standing that we're declared right before Almighty God on account of what Christ has done for us. When he died on that cross, he was punished for us. And he took the punishment that we deserved. And he died and rose again. And all that he did, his, death, his life, his death, everything, is pardons us when we believe in him. And he's put to our account. And all we do is receive the gift of pardon in Christ. Verse 22, Romans 3, 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto, one, uh, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. Notice there, look at the Greek. 
Look at the Greek. Very careful. Look at the Greek. Look at the Greek. The Greek here is very, very important. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, here's the Greek, of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe. Very, very important here, folks. Very important. Many modern, many Bible translation, translations change the words by faith of Jesus Christ to in Jesus Christ. Okay? Many modern Bible translations change the words by faith of Jesus Christ to in Christ. Right? So why is it, why is the King James translated by faith of Jesus Christ rather than in Jesus Christ? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at it very carefully. Let's go back there, verse 22. So we're justified by the righteousness of God, which is Christ, yeah? Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. The life of Jesus, his faith, his life, all that he did is what we believe in that justifies us. So then you have faith later on. By faith of Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Yes, faith is important. Belief in Christ is vital, but it's of faith of Jesus. It's his life, his death, and all that he's done is, is, is the righteousness of God and put to our account. It's a very important Greek statement. So let's go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, and see it again. Philippians 3, verse 9. And he be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now, what's the difference? Why is it important to emphasize the faith of Christ? Because modern translators have taken the faith of Christ out and put in. And so what they're stressing is in it's our faith that justifies us. It's what man does. Man has faith and this justifies us. That's a wrong emphasis. We are to have faith, yes. But that is not what justifies us. It's the faith of Christ that justifies us. It's his life, all that he does. You see, the faith of Christ puts the emphasis on Christ and all that Christ has done. If you change the word faith in Christ, it's what we do. Our faith in him justifies us. And it's a very subtle but very important difference. The faith of Christ, all that he's done, justifies us. And faith receives the gift of salvation in Christ. Let's go to uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. We'll see this in operation again. It's a very important thing. Uh, a subtle change in the Greek can give a very massive emphasis on how you understand the doctrine of justification by faith. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Galatians uh, 2, verse 16. Right. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, so we're not justified by the works of the law, by doing good, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, you see. The faith of Christ, not, sorry. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we believe in Jesus Christ. So we believe in him, yes, we have faith in him, but we are justified by the faith of Jesus Christ, by all that he has done, you see. The objective grounds of salvation is in Christ, not in us, not in our faith, right? That we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life now I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son 
of God, by the faith of the Son of God, by all that Christ has done, you see. And gave himself for me. Wow. Amen. So our faith is based on who Christ is and what he's done. He's put to our account. Now, if you go to Romans 3.25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. The word propitiation is the idea of appeasement of the wrath of God. And we can see that in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4, 10, and 6, about appeasement, that, God, that Christ is a sacrifice for our sin to take away the wrath of God. So Isaiah 53... Isaiah, Isaiah 53, Isaiah uh, 53, Isaiah 53, verse 4, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did him esteem and stricken to men of God and afflicted, so he bore our sin upon himself, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So he's judged on our behalf. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When shall thou make the soul an offering for sin? He shall see his seed. So he died in our place. What it means is we, we have a debt to, to God. We owe God when we sin. It's like owing a bank. We owe the Bank of England a billion pounds, every one of us say, and we can't pay it. So every one of us is a sinner and we do wrong and we owe God. We can't pay our debt. We can't get rid of our guilt. But we know the bank manager the, of, of the Bank of England and he is our best friend and loves us. And he's a billionaire and he signs a check and pays your debt. So Christ, uh, God, signed a check and paid a check and that check was the blood of Jesus Christ Just wait a Sorry about that. So the, the check is paid by the blood of Christ. Signed with the blood of Christ. And the blood of Christ is so important. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians 1, 7. You have to believe that the blood was shed for you. Ephesians 1, verse 7. Ephesians 1 verse 7 In whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace His blood was shed for you and me. He took the wrath that you and I deserve and his faith in Christ All that he's done for us is put to our account So if you turn to Romans 10 14 Romans 10 14 Romans 10 14 it says how then shall they call on him whom they have not? Uh, Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you call upon Christ, have faith in him, you shall be saved. If you turn to John 3, 15, John 3, 15. You have to have faith in Christ. John 3, 15. John 3, 15. John 3, 15. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's faith in Christ. What we believe in Christ saves us. So we've come to the end. We've only skirted a little bit in Romans 3. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to do some more sermons on Romans chapter 3. I look at justification by faith in a more detailed way. And I might even give a scholarly lecture on my other channel uh, next week on the history of the doctrine of justification by faith. And do some sermons here as well all right but excuse me
But what we've done, briefly, only briefly, we've given a definition, excuse me, of justification by faith, that our status is a legal standing before God because of what Christ has done. We've looked at the Jews missed justification by faith, even though they had the scriptures. We've looked at we cannot earn our salvation by good works, all fall short of the glory of God. And then thirdly, we've looked at our justification is in Christ and all that he has done for us and not in ourselves, and we receive it by faith. And what all this means ultimately is you can have a right standing before God, that you can have a clean conscience before God. To know that your sins are forgiven is a wonderful thing. Turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 4. Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 4. Since... Is it Colossians chapter 1, verse 4? Let's see. No, I got it wrong there. Sorry. If we turn to 1 Timothy 2, 6... We'll get there. 1 Timothy 2 6. One Timothy. One Timothy two six. Who gave himself a ransom for all? Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time? He gave a ransom for all, all the elect, that is. His life was a ransom to save us. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1 uh, verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by a tradition of your fathers. Verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We're redeemed by Christ. We're forgiven by his blood. We're forgiven and restored in Christ because of all that he's done. What is the application of all that? If you have guilt today, you feel weighted down with guilt. All you have to remember is that stop looking at your guilt, but remember that Christ died for you on that cross. That he gave his life for you. He shed his blood for you. And your guilt is covered in the blood of Christ. There is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. Stop being weighed down by your guilt. Your guilt has been taken away at the cross. You have been declared right before God. Secondly, it should motivate you to holiness. To know that you are righteous, not because of yourself, but because of Christ. Because of what he has done should motivate you to holiness. It will purify your heart to meditate on the Christ is your grounds of justification. It will invigorate you. It will renew you. It will strengthen you. It will empower you to move away from sin and to go forward in holiness because you know that you are saved, not because of yourself, but because of Christ and all that he did. Thirdly, you do not justify yourself by your feelings. Don't rely upon your feelings. Don't rely upon your feelings, how you feel. It has already been declared that you are forgiven in Christ. All you have to do is receive it by faith. And fourthly, remember, if you today are a Muslim, a Jew, a Hindu, a Buddhist, a nominal Christian, an atheist, an agnostic. You cannot get into heaven by what you do. The carnal mind is an enmity against God. You cannot do it. No matter how many Ramadans you do, no matter how much you go uh, and, 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 and wash yourself in, 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 in one of the holy rivers in India, or whether you read all the great books of, of atheism or whatever, there's nothing that you can do to get yourself right with God on a human level. God has to come down and God has to pay your debt and he paid it in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says that you have to believe in him to be saved. The only way to be saved and to know God is through the blood of Christ. It is the great salvation that God has provided. It is the great way to heaven. All that Christ has done for you. So turn away from your filthy 
rights. Turn away from all your righteousness. It's nothing. It's nothing. And turn to the purity, the wonder, the glory, the majesty, the greatness, the glorious majesty of Jesus Christ in all his glory and purity and holiness and magnificence. For every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and he will forgive you, redeem you, restore you and make you a new creature in Christ because he has done it with his life. He said it is finished. He paid the price on that cross for you. And you can be forgiven today. You can be restored today. You can be a new creature in Christ today. You can know the living God today. You as a Christian can be renewed and restored and refreshed and strengthened by meditating on the grand doctrine of the justification by faith. That you are declared right on account of Christ's death, life, death and righteousness. You are declared before holy God right before him not guilty and all that christ has done for you is put to your account and you are washed and clean for oh, the blood of the lamb and all is well let's pray father i thank you for this day i thank you for your goodness and your blessings and i pray for all those that hear your word today strengthen them and comfort them and encourage them and may they know your peace and joy and may those who do not know you today may they come to know you and may those who know you may they be renewed and strengthened to live a godly holy life bless them oh father and use them for your glory in jesus name amen amen god bless you hope that was a blessing to you search the scriptures be a berean don't forget my website jasonburnspreacher.com 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 remember that i'm on the streets around the uk often preaching the gospel sharing literature and i need your prayers i also run a fellowship and i need your prayers i need your prayers i need you to stand with me in the proclamation of the word of god and pray 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 regularly for me i beg you god bless you Keep in the word, keep strong in the word and serve the Lord for your generation and continue to be the man or the woman God has called you in these days. God bless you and have a lovely evening. Take care. Hi folks, so you're okay today, it's good to be with you. This is Jason Burns and we're looking at uh, Romans uh, chapter 3, Romans, cha uh, Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4. If you'd like to turn to your Bible, Romans chapter 4. Romans uh, chapter 4. <clears throat> let's pray father we thank you for this day and for your grace and for your love and for your blessings and father i just pray as your word is shared today that it would be a blessing to people and that father you would use it for your glory in the name of jesus amen amen uh, my website is jasonburnspreacher.com 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 there's loads of Bible teaching and apologetic material on those uh, on that website <coughs> that will bless you. We're looking at Romans chapter 4, and uh, we're looking at the doctrine of justification by faith. It says, What shall we then? What shall we say then that Abraham our father? Sorry, the religion was. What shall we say then that Abraham our fathers pertaining to the flesh had found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he had wherein to be glory, but not before God. But what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man 
through God imputed righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Commit this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had just been, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the, the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for there is no, where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead and called those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered for our offences and was raised again for our justification. Billy Graham went to see an evangelist, a televangelist, who committed a grave sin by uh, embellishing money, taking money that wasn't his. This evangelist was in prison, nobody else would visit him or care about him. Billy Graham, when he saw this man, gave him a hug. In a way, justification by faith is God declaring right a person because of what Christ has done, and faith receives that gift. And as we come into salvation, we are no condemnation to them that are in Christ, and we can have that fatherly hug of God through the blood of Christ. Jerry Bridges says, your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace, and your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. Cyprian said, no one is safe by his own strength, but he is safe by the grace and mercy of God. Romans 4, 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. We need the grace and mercy of God. The Jews of, of Paul's day believed that they didn't need the mercy of God, that they could earn God's favor. And so Paul is attacking these ideas. For example, the Jews, if you read the Mishnah, believed that Abraham was perfect, that if they got circumcised and followed the law, then they would be okay. And so Paul attacks these three pillars that the Jews have used to buttress themselves up in their own self-righteousness. We can see that in Romans 4 verse 1. And, she, and what shall we say then, that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh and found? So it, it, it's saying, look, here's Abraham. You've got this Abraham wrong. And then chapter 4, verse 9 and 11, it's about circumcision. Come with this blessedness then upon the, uncir the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So Paul says, no, not by circumcision. 
are we saved? And then he goes about the law, Romans 4.13. Uh, verse 15, because the law worketh wrath, for there no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is a faith that it might be of grace. They said we're saved by following the law. Paul says no, it's by faith in Christ. If you turn to Romans 4, verse 17, it says, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead, and calleth things that which are not, though they were, verse 18, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So Paul is using Abraham as an example of faith, that Abraham, before he was circumcised, before he had uh, before the law came was given a promise by god that the nations would be blessed through the messiah and abraham had faith and it was this faith that was accredited as righteousness the faith that is based on the character and promise of god dr kent use a uh, a reformed minister in 1955 at the age of 12 at a communion service in a Presbyterian church heard a message of the gospel. He felt strangely touched in his heart, convicted of sin, and he came to a knowledge of Christ in, in a moment by faith. It wasn't by works. You come by faith in Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If, you, you, if we turn to Romans... Uh, Chapter 10, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Lord Jesus, and thou shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We need to believe on Christ as our only salvation. Now that is what Paul is teaching in Romans chapter 4, but using Abraham as an example for this stupendous amazing doctrine of justification by faith and i want to make the first point that you are a sinner saved by grace if you turn to romans chapter 4 verse 1 to 8 what shall we say then that abraham our father has perished into the flesh and found for if abraham was justified by works he had whereof to glory but not before god for what saith the scripture abraham believed god and it was counted unto him for righteousness now to him that worketh this the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness even as david also described the blessedness of the man whom god imputeth righteousness without works saying blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered in schindler's list the film mr schindler dropped a coin on the railway station and he went to find it and he was broken hearted because he knew that coin could have saved the child he had regrets at the end of his life that he didn't save uh, uh, as many children as he could because he rescued them out of the concentration camps of, of, of hitler's horrible regime and he, and he had a, a tremendous feeling of regret and we can all be weighed down with regret but it's interesting in verses 1 to 7, uh, Paul mentions Abraham, verse 3, for what the scriptures, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But who was, who was Abraham? Abraham was righteous, but who was he? Abraham had an extra woman, Hagar. Abraham was a man who gave his wife to Pharaoh. Abraham was not a righteous man in many respects. And yet, because he promised, believed in the promise of God, he was made righteous. You can look at Genesis chapter 16, verse 4, Genesis chapter 12, verse 17. But grace comes to Abraham in Genesis 15, 1 to 6, where God gives him a promise. I remember once being in town and I was preaching and I remember just having a rest and a guy sat near me 
and he kept hitting himself, hitting himself. I mean, really hitting himself so hard. He obviously had some kind of mental issue. We are like that sometimes metaphorically and emotionally. We hit ourselves with the regret of the things that we've done. But we should realize if we believe in Christ, they are washed and clean. We are righteous in Christ. Righteous in Christ. Romans 4, 6. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. Even David was saved. Even David had an God's righteousness put to his account. Do you remember David in Psalm 31, how he sinned? Give me a clean heart, wash me. You remember? David was a man who killed Uriah, who slept with Bathsheba, who was not his wife. And yet God here gave, said that he was righteous, not because he was righteous, but because God imputed to him, reckoned to him. What does it mean? What does the Greek idea of imputation or reckon mean? It means this. Imagine you have a bill here, and it's got all the things that you owe. You owe 500 pounds for a suit. You owe 1,000 pounds for a television. You owe 5,000 pounds for a car, and you have all these bills here. And imagine here is is an account with a hundred thousand pounds and somebody puts it to your account it's now a credit with you and all your debt is cancelled and you're in credit that's what it means for imputation or reckon christ what he did for you on that cross is put to your account it's put in your credit and now you have the righteousness of god in christ it's a wonderful doctrine it's absolutely wonderful, friends. It truly is wonderful that you are justified by faith. Now you might say, well, what does faith mean? The word justification is a judicial term. It means you're declared right before God. The word faith is the idea that you trust, not in your faith, but in the character and promise and work of God. All your Faith is in in him, not in yourself. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It's a glorious, wonderful, magnificent doctrine that we are justified by faith. And it's a doctrine, friends. Bible teaching. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. We have redemption. We've been paid. Our, 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 our debt has been paid. And we are set free, my friends. You're a sinner saved by grace. God knew what he was saving. God knew he was saving you. And you carry your regrets. You carry them with, with you. There's a, a spaghetti western. And in the Spaghetti Western, there's this guy walking around, dragging, dragging a a uh, a coffin, and that's what we're like sometimes. We drag in the coffin of our regrets. We we drag the past behind us, but it's gone. It's under the blood of Christ. It's under the righteousness of God. You are washed in the blood. You are washed in Christ. You are a new creature, and all things have passed away, and all things have become new. Number two, the grounds of your salvation is not in you, but in Christ. The grounds of your salvation is not in you, but in Christ. There's a story that a preacher says uh, about a frog that fell into uh, a, 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 an urn of milk. He tried to get out and he couldn't get out. It was paddling, 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 paddling as fast as it could and paddled and paddled, paddled, paddled and eventually... As it paddled, the milk turned into butter and he was able to climb out. And that, my friends, is to sum up religion today. That is to sum up the way mankind thinks today. Do enough effort, do enough work, and you will be okay. But that is not the faith that Paul is talking about. Romans 4.16 Therefore it is a faith that it might be of grace, 
to the end of the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. It's by faith in the promise of salvation. Verse 17. It is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him, whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. <coughs> Abraham had no children, and God promised him he would give him a nation as many as the stars in the sky. And Abraham looked at his life, it looked hopeless, yet he had faith, and God honored that faith. Faith, again, is the is in the trustworthiness of God. It's in the God, uh, in what God has done. It's not like you muster faith up, or it's your faith. No, faith is resting and trusting in the promises of God, in what God has done. It's all in God, you see. William Booth said, for Paul teaches and proves that our election and eternal glory must be entirely of grace. It's not going to church that saves you. It's not belonging to a particular denomination, whether it be the Baptist, the Presbyterians, or the Calvinists, or the Charismatics, or Pentecostals, or whatever, or the Catholic Church. It's, a, it's not your fears. Even your fears don't save you. You might be fearful. Even your backsliding, you might say, well, I backslid. It means I must be a Christian. You're relying on things of yourself. It's about Christ. It's about looking to him. It's about resting on him. It's about believing in him. It's about trusting in him. It's not your feelings. It's not about you. It's not what you can do. It's Christ. It's all Christ. John Newton, who, who, who wrote Amazing Grace, was a swearer, a blasphemer, and a slave trader. And then he became saved and he found grace. And he found it in Christ, in Jesus. It is grace at the beginning, says Dr. Marty Lloyd-Jones. It is grace at the beginning and grace at the end, so that when you and I come to lie upon our deathbeds, one thing that should comfort us and help us and strengthen us, there is the thing that helped us in that beginning. Not what we have been, nor what we have done, but the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Our Lord, the Christian life starts with grace. It must continue with grace. It ends with grace. Grace, wondrous grace. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Not I, but the grace of God, which is with me, says Dr. Martin Lord John. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Corinthians 5 21 for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him for he is for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him he was made sin for us he died for us he rose again for us it was he it's all in him Jesus Christ, how marvelous that it is not based upon you, that it's not based upon your ability, your rationality, your intellectualism, your moralism. It's nothing based in you or your experience. It's based on Christ, on the Lord who died and shed his blood and rose again. It's all in him. And thirdly, you're completely saved once and for all. Romans chapter 4, verse 7. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Verse 22. The word covered there means completely done away with. Romans 4, 22 and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. 
that you see when Christ rose from the dead it was sealed it was done salvation was totally complete when Christ died on the cross the Lord said it is finished when you believe in the Lord his righteousness is reckoned to you and you are saved and you cannot lose that salvation if you backslide we can all do the moonwalk do you remember Michael Jackson he did his moonwalk we can do the moonwalk as Christians we can go back and we can backslide but if we repent and come back to Christ the justification is there in Christ we don't lose it 1 John 1 9 1 John 1 9 1 John 1 9 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we come and confess our backsliding he will cleanse you he will wash you he will refresh you he will renew you all come back to him you might have drifted and you might have fallen into sin you might keep falling into sin but come back to him come and wash yourself in the blood of christ there is joy peace comfort love oceans of grace oceans of kindness oceans of tenderness that will wrap his arms around you for he is a mighty gracious god and he will forgive you now come back he said jason i've fallen into deep sin jason i keep falling into sin come back and keep looking to that cross and get covered in the blood and righteousness of Christ and be washed in the blood. Know the soul, joy, and power, and love of God in your life. I've been recently talking to Catholic brethren. And I don't want to knock them, but what I keep hearing is about miracles at Lourdes and what that people have seen Mary and apparitions and they've seen these miracles and I hear very little of Jesus I hear very little of the Lord I hear very little of him I hear little where he is magnified all oh, that I know that some of you do but you don't magnify him I hear these miracles and these stories about Mary but I want to hear about Jesus I want to hear about the King I want to hear about my Lord who shed his blood for me so Paul is trying to defend the doctrine of justification the Jews are saying the same because they're in Abraham's family the same because of circumcision the same because they keep the law and Paul is saying no Abraham had faith he was given a promise about the many nations being blessed and he had faith and it was his faith in that promise that he was saved it was imputed to him as righteousness he was not perfect but it was imputed to him reckoned to him put to his count accredited to him and this is how we are to live faith in Christ it's not our faith that saves us but it is the promise and character and work of God in Jesus and if you want to do a study on this read Galatians chapter 3 let's just go there just a few verses just to give you a taste there but if you want to study this in more depth go to Galatians 3 and have a Bible study at home on this with your husband and your wife or friends and family and have a little study of it Galatians chapter 3 and we'll look at verse 6 even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness see Paul is bringing it home again in the book of Galatians Charles Spurgeon the great reformed Baptist minister said this people do not like the doctrine of grace given them sorry if people do not like the doctrine of grace give them all the more of it people need to hear about the gospel people need to hear about the doctrine of justification by faith people need it they need to hear it. They need to hear sound doctrine. People don't want to hear sound doctrine. But it's doctrine. It's teaching of the word of God. And we've looked at a brief exposition of Romans chapter 4. And I hope it's been a blessing to you. This pre was preached on a Sunday afternoon at the Hayward Presbyterian, Presbyterian Reform Fellowship. 
you want to come to the fellowship we meet at 4 p.m every sunday and thursday evening we have a bible study at 7 30 p.m you can contact me from my website jasonburstpreacher.com if you want the details to get to the house and uh, please pray for the fellowship that it will grow and prosper and be blessed there aren't many presbyterian groups around and it will be good to see it prosper that we link up with some presbyterian group uh, and begin to move forward in that area and uh, i do support other churches other denominations other groups uh, like i said a few weeks ago i supplied one church with many many boxes of, of tracks and I supply evangelists with tracks and i support evangelists and so i encourage people who are not of the same denomination of grouping as me uh, i encourage them but uh, do pray that this fellowship will grow and uh, it be blessed we're having some amazing times in the word of god but uh, it needs god to own the word and, and to build it so please pray so let's pray father we thank you for this day we thank you that we're covered in your righteousness we thank you that we're covered in your truth we thank you that we're covered in your love and in your blessings and in your comfort and in your encouragement and we give you the praise we give you the glory and the honor Father, I pray for this message, that it would be blessed in people's hearts, that they would know your love, they would know your grace, they would know your power, and they would know your joy. And we give you the prayers and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I think I'll leave it there. And uh, I've got another Bible study to do and maybe a few videos, but uh, I'll uh, leave you with this. I hope it's been a blessing to you. God bless you. Take care.